Stephen. It's great to be in touch on opposite sides of the country. Hi, Britt. Good to see you. We are here to talk about your new publication, Stephen Shore Transparencies. And I had the pleasure of writing an essay for this book, but the you know, the, the design, the sequencing, the selection of pictures, that um, has all come together so beautifully. So congratulations on this publication. Thanks. Well, a lot of what you just mentioned, I, I owe to the people at Mac Books. He worked on all of them issues. They did, a, you all did such a beautiful job. I was um, really appreciating the, well, the format of it. it feels really good in the hands. Um, it's, uh, it uh, sets off uh, uh, both horizontal and vertical um, pictures beautifully. And it has just a really beautiful typography and that sort of linear element in the design that you see on all the pages and on the cover. I love that because it has a modernity. It doesn't traffic in nostalgia or period um, uh, graphics or, you know, the, the 21st century version of the 70s. It's really very much in the present. And that, I think, is the case with the work itself. Thank you. How? Um, um, how well, that, that's a, it's an issue that I face in my work because people, some people comment about how nostalgic my pictures are. And they have to understand that when they were first shown, people were not saying, oh, it looks like the 70s. They're saying, it looks like today. Why did you even photograph it? Right. So for them, that, that kind of, the fact of them being in the present was, uh, for some, I think, inexplicable or, um, or they, they couldn't get it, right? I mean, that was too much of the now. But as I'm saying that, I, I think maybe if you really are in the present, even though there are aspects of it that become dated, there's something that remains in the present, that the experience is in the present. I, that, I, I agree 100%. are 40 years old. Yes, that, and that's why I think, you know, the book feels so new and fresh and, um, and you can just sort of walk right into it. And even though, okay, car designs have changed, what have you, but it, it, doesn't feel like a time capsule to me at all. And I think you're right. It has to do with the approach to the picture making and the, you know, the kind of, um, I don't know if intention is the right word, but the manner of looking, let's say, that, um, that, that created the pictures, you know, that they were observational in the moment and they really remain so. Since we're here in part to talk about the book and I think our, our uh, viewers will be able to see some example spreads, um, they, I guess you might call it a prologue, if you will, the first part of the book where you have a kind of sequence and freeze of images reproduced at, um, at a, almost a snapshot size, right? Pretty close. Um, one um, leaning to the next. How did you um, sequence those? What was the thinking on that selection? That really was uh, uh, Michael Mack's idea. Mm -hmm. or people at the publishing house. Um, I, I find I like working with publishers who have very definite ideas. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not one of the people who's, who thinks this is how I see the book. This is the only way it can be now fulfill it. I'm, I'm interested in working with people who have experience in the, in the medium and who have ideas about it. Uh, how to fulfill the ideas. And, well, that, uh, yeah, that, that but, accounts for a lot of variety in your, in your bibliography. Um, things that might, um, I know, publication that might really take on the album aesthetic and, um, and others like this that are uh, more of a clean, um, uh, let the pictures speak for themselves. And of course, you've had a lot of exhibition catalogs where there's more text um, provided by a um, variety of writers or comparative illustrations and so on. So yeah, that, um, I think you've, uh, you've had some great collaborations. And speaking of collaborations, one of the reasons I was so excited that you were willing to take this on is ever since I read 
uh, your book on new topographics, I felt that you had um, a window into the thinking of the photographers of that period. Oh, well, thank you. Like you got it. And uh, so that it seemed like that would set you up perfectly to, to look at this body of work. It was a real pleasure to, um, to do so and in, a, in a focused, concentrated way with a lot of um, visuals to, uh, to go through and, um, and connect to those ideas and contexts that you're referring to. So thank you. It's always, um, always a pleasure to think about and write about your work and, and in some ways a little intimidating because you've had so many great, <laughs> there have been so many great artists and curators, including yourself who have written about it. But the fact is there's always more to say and more to, um, more, more associations to make. And every, every one of us has, you know, a personal response, aesthetic response as well. But for me, I think you're right. I, I, I like to draw connections to, um, uh, currents of thought uh, that were in the air at the time of picture making and at the at and at the different times they were shown and interpreted you know it's, a, it's cumulative mm -hmm. so, well, one of the things I was, I've been thinking about today was in in this time of, of lockdown um, I've been taking on, on lots of interviews uh -huh. and so it and and so writing and so I've been thinking a lot about how this fitted in with other work I was doing. Um, and one thing I was thinking about today was the first section of pictures was done in 1971. Yeah. These were done in Union, New Jersey. And then there's a gap of two years. Mm -hmm. when, and that gap was when I was doing uh, American Surfaces. And then the book picks up again when I, when I start using an eight by 10 uh, in uh, Uncommon Places. But that first group is visually kind of different. Yes. And, and what, I don't remember a lot of what I had in my mind at the time I was taking the pictures because we're talking about almost 50 years ago. Yeah. But I do remember that, uh, the, the Union, New Jersey. I, I was interested in how to take a picture that felt immediate, that, that felt like experience. And this comes back to something we talked about a few minutes ago, being in the present. Yes. And, and can that, does that stay present into the future? Um, and part of that is getting rid of visual convention. Mm -hmm. And what I was thinking about in those pictures was if I did, if I threw out convention, am I left with what we would call mistakes? Mm -hmm. And so I intentionally did pictures that looked like the kind of pictures that you might have taken if you picked up a camera and accidentally took a picture. Yeah. I know some people have said that they thought they might have been taken from a car window. They, they weren't taken from a car window. They were... I was using my Leica, I was framing them consciously exactly as you see them. Uh -huh. they, were, they weren't random and, at all. But I was trying to get at a breaking down convention by doing things that in a certain way looked wrong. Yes. And yeah, now that you mention that, um, I think the assumption of uh, you know a casual viewer would be to look at that first section of pictures especially and think as you just said that they were taken through a car window without realizing that they're lacking in any of the framing that you know a car window would have imposed you know the elements yeah. of the of the the car itself that you were in um, I also went since you mentioned kind of um, a present moment. Um, there are a couple of places in the book, including in this very first section, pages 18 to 19 are two closely consecutive views. And there are a couple of places where on facing pages in the book, you have, um, you know, clearly shots that were made, you know, at the roughly in, with one in one campaign, you know, one thought process, let's say. And, um, and that feels different from how you've talked about and how one looks at your eight by tens, which are more kind of 
the singular picture um, that, that kind of does what it needs to do. So talk about those kind of pairings and, and how um, they came together for in rediscovering them for this book. Well, with the 8x10, I very rarely took a second picture of anything. Yeah. There are not any pairings to be had, uh, or, or very, very few. Yeah. Uh, even with this work, I, you know, I, for a few years in interviews, I talked about this, that, that it was the cost of the eight by 10 imposed a visual economy Mm -hmm. Because in today's money, it costs about maybe $75 a shot for a sheet of film processing and a proof print. Mm -hmm. um, and if you go out and shoot 10, 15 pictures in a day, you spend a lot of money. Yeah. Uh, and, and I had come up with looking back on the time and, and with this thought that somehow this that out of economy, I, I was forced to decide what it is I actually wanted. Mm -hmm. Knowing that I couldn't play it safe, that if I took a safe picture, I wouldn't be getting anywhere. Yeah. So I had to be able to make bad pictures, take chances, but the way the economy entered was I didn't take two pictures of anything. And then when I was walking through, um, the retrospective at MoMA, I realized I never took many pictures of anything. In the American surfaces where I was using 35 millimeter, I didn't. Um, I did, it wasn't a religious thing that if I saw something different, I would, I would take another picture. But I never was a photographer who would shoot 10, 15, 35 pictures of, of something. I would, I, I think I pretty much always knew what I wanted, even in, in the Warhol period or even before. I, as I was looking through, I realized I just never did that. Yeah, did you, is that um, part of, partly a result of the, organi the visual organization you kind of have in your mind is kind of already there and you can execute it? Uh, um, it wasn't something I was trying for, and still today with my phone, I mean, I have no, I have no objection to taking a second one. It isn't like I'm imposing a discipline on myself. Yeah. If I, with my phone, unlike a tripod, my hand can waver a little bit when I'm taking the picture, and as I take it, I realize the framing was off from what I wanted. So, because my hand wavered, so I take it again. Yeah. That that happens. Yeah. Or if I'm photographing on the, people on a street and people are moving, I'll just, I'll take as many pictures as needed. But if I'm photographing, I'm at my desk now and there's a stapler here. And if I wanted to photograph this stapler, I, I would pretty much know where I wanted to be. Mm -hmm. And so I think it came from that sense of, of knowing what I wanted. And so there was, it never felt like I was, I had to search for the picture with the camera and then afterward figure out what it was I really was after. I, I think I always pretty much had an idea of, of where I was beginning and where I wanted to end. Yeah. So the, um, the years covered in this book probably um, um, were years of honing that, that, that match between what you wanted and getting it, right? I mean, did you, when you look back at it, you know, look back at the archive of those pictures, are you seeing that kind of um, fall into place? Well, where that was really on my mind during those years was when I was working with my view camera. Uh-huh. Because that's that's where I was on on the edge of my figuring out things visually. Mm -hmm. um, so there are two years missing in, at the beginning. So I have 1971, and then it goes to 74, and those two years are American surfaces. Mm -hmm. American surfaces fits in, in in that gap, and what happened 
when I was doing American Surfaces, and this relates to what you wrote about in your essay, when you talk about photographs that are more like speaking than writing, yeah. that I wanted the visual equivalent of, of speaking, where it's, it's conversational, as we're having this conversation now. When we sit at our computer and write, a different vocabulary begins to appear. Sentences become structured in a different way. There are more dependent clauses. Uh, and this is what I was thinking about during the American Surfaces years, that to get that sense of immediacy, of direct experience, what I tried in Union, New Jersey wasn't getting it. The mistakes weren't getting it. And what I realized I wanted was to pay attention to the experience of seeing. And so I would, um, at random moments of the day, whenever I thought of it, took a, a, a picture of my field of vision, a mental picture, to see this is what the experience of seeing looks like. If I'm looking at you now, I'm seeing your face in a, in a frame in, on my monitor and the computer and my desk with some unpaid bills sitting on it and uh, a pen over here and the windows behind and I'm seeing this whole thing. And so I could take a picture of that. And I found two things happened. One is I learned consciously what seeing looks like so that I could put it into pictures and, and, and relate that. The second thing is I started paying attention to things I wouldn't have paid attention to before. That, that visual convention has two aspects. One is how you make the picture, the composition, in other words, but also what you choose to photograph. Mm -hmm. uh, and because I was taking these mental screenshots at random moments, it was often when I'm in the back of a taxi and looking at the, the plexiglass barrier, or I'm having a meal, or I've, I'm lying in bed watching television. Uh, and so I, I, that naturally then became the subject of the pictures, uh, which you see in American surfaces. And so after I got that visual vocabulary of seeing pretty much down, that I felt like I got what I wanted there. I then started using the view camera, which introduced a kind of very formal um, exploration of photography. And it also changed how I understood the viewer's relationship to the picture. And the, the first, big four by eight, uh, first big eight by 10 trip I took after I spent a year using a four by five, I borrowed an eight by 10 camera from Weston Neff, who was living in New York as, and was one of my closest friends, and went to Easton, Pennsylvania. I picked Easton because that was the closest place to New York that Walker Evans did eight by 10 pictures that I was aware of. And, and Evans was my hero. So I went to Easton and the first day of shooting, there's a picture of a, a red and white Volkswagen van on an, at an intersection. Yeah. And I'm, as I'm taking that picture and figuring out where to stand to make sense of that intersection, I noticed across the street in the window of a building, I saw it from the sign in the window, it was a dentist office. I saw a young boy sitting at the window, looking out the window with his breath on the glass. Mm. And I realized that the eight by 10 had such high resolution that I could stand hundreds of feet away and make a picture that's not about that boy. That's about this whole scene. And a viewer can move their attention into the scene and look at houses on the hills across a valley down the street, or look at, the, look at that boy in the window. They can move their attention through the space of the picture. And that's a very different kind of relationship of viewer to picture than I was exploring with American surfaces. And so I think that as I was doing that and making these pictures that were not representing seeing, but representing creating a, a, a rectangular world to explore that I also had with me a Leica and took these more first person 
more notational kind of pictures mm -hmm. as an outlet for when I see saw things that didn't fit in the framework of what I was doing with the eight by ten. So I think that's how um, the work in transparencies came about. Yeah, and the interconnections are so interesting, and they, I think because without you having um, kind of undertaken that those exercises in mental seeing and thinking about seeing, you might have been just taking a picture of the van and not noticed, and you, yep. you, you know you and you would have gotten a picture of the van, but um, but you wouldn't have also noticed and then created the possibility for the viewer to notice the boy, the other, the layering and so on. So I think that um, that that way of seeing is um, so constant, even while the formats and the, the kind of nature of the apparatus has an effect as well. But, you know, that's that's just the machine. That's not the seeing, if you will. Um, and another, the way you just described that mental picturing, you know, it sounds like a, kind of a version of meditation. And after all, that's about being in the present and being noticing, paying attention, noticing what's there. And although the eight by 10 work is, is not the work that's in the book, um, one thing that you're saying that connects to eight by 10 work is using that camera forces at two points in the process um, a mental conceptualization of the image. Mm. You don't walk around looking through the camera to find a picture. Yeah. If, I were to, if I were to pull into a town and want to look for pictures, I'd walk around, I would know intuitively the field of view of the lens. Every time I'd get a new lens, I'd learn that lens so I could see like the lens. So I, I did, it was second, it was second nature. I, I could stand on a spot, I know where the frame would go. Mm -hmm. And I'd put a, a quarter down on the ground where the tripod was gonna go, the center of the tripod, like, like uh, 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 someone on a putting green putting a marker down where their ball is. Um, and then I'd walk around and put a couple of those quarters down and then go back and get my camera. But what that means is I had an idea in my mind of what the picture was. I already mentally took the picture. If there was something changing, if that happened to be on a street corner and people were walking, obviously I'm, I don't have that fully in advance and I'm open to the changes in the experience. So that's the first place that requires a mental conceptualization. And it's not just me. I can't understand how anyone can use a view camera without doing that. It, because you, you can't walk around looking through the camera. No. The second thing, and this is true only of an 8x10, not of a 4x5, is that the very finest final adjustments, uh, usually of the rising front, maybe the focus and then front, then the rising front and your arms are out to hold the front of the camera. Mm -hmm. If your arms are out to hold the front of the camera and move the front up and down, you can't be back far enough to see the entire image on the ground glass. The image, if my hands are out here, the image, the ground glass is this far away from me yeah. and it's the big. So, a, a pitfall that inexperienced photographers fall in is they will look at, say, where does the top of this house come in relation to the edge? How much sky? And I'll look at that one little thing and move the rising front up and down until that looked right. Mm -hmm. But doing that, you can make that look right and forget how that change affects the rest of the picture because you literally can't see the rest of the picture. Yeah. So that means to use an 8 by 10 coherently to produce a picture that feels unified at a second point in the process now, you have to have a mental image of the final picture. Mm -hmm. So that as I'm doing, moving the rising front, I'm, I'm not looking just at what's happening on the ground glass. My whole 
the whole mental picture is, is shifting. Yeah. And so it feels very meditative. Yes, and you're, you're making that effort of attention and, and uh, concentration to keep that mental image there, you know, and, yeah. to, and to attend to the aspects of it that you need, you know, to fill in what you're not able to see around glass. Yeah. Really interesting. And um, for the, uh, talk a little bit about um, then the differences or similarities be between that um, evocation of working with the 8x10 and then and using the, using the small format and, and looking through the lens. I mean, there too, you've said you're, you're not kind of um, periscoping around looking for a picture, um, but, but you do have the uh, ability to see the edges, I guess, in a different way. Yes. Um, although I think using the view camera is, is such a tool for training mm -hmm. that um, if I use any camera, I'm aware of seeing a mental image of what I'm about to take. And, um, yeah, when we were, um, um, uh, when I was preparing my essay and thinking about the pictures, um, we corresponded a little bit about the couple of instances where you would make a picture with both camera, with, with the large format and small format camera of, of the same scene. And this is probably something you talk about with your students in various kinds of classes too, but to, but to um, maybe explain to viewers here what, um, what the different outcomes are going to be that you have dialed in to your thinking when you've got those two cameras in one motif. I, I think the, the two cameras, well, different cameras have different personalities and they can push a photographer in a certain direction. Although it's not, it's, it's not um, written in stone. In other words, Oh, let me back up and, and, and say what I mean about pushing a photographer in different directions. Uh, uh, many years ago, in the mid-70s, I went to a lecture that my friend Todd Papa George gave about the time he was uh, coming out with his little book, Walker Evans and Robert Frank, an essay on influence. And he was showing uh, Evans' work and Frank's work where the the subject matter is very similar and, and similar themes and it was clear that Frank was aware of of these themes in Evans book American photographs and I became very interested in the difference in the way the frame operated in the pictures and I and I realized and by this point I'd been using an eight by ten for several years that when you're making these very fine final decisions of framing of um, the rising front with an eight by 10. You have a dark cloth over your head mm -hmm. and you see nothing beyond the frame. You don't see a 32nd of an inch beyond the frame. The frame on the ground glass is exactly what the film is going to get. Um, and then it's black beyond that where a Leica, which is what Frank used, you see, you're looking through a clear viewfinder. Everything is in sharp focus all the time. In the middle of the viewfinder is a white rectangle. And that rectangle is the frame of the picture. Mm -hmm. So you are literally seeing what's outside the frame. You see the frame as a line that falls on the world, where by 10, the end of the picture is the end of the world in a way. Correct. It just cuts it right out. Yeah. Yes. And I think that influences how people use the two cameras. And when I realized that, this was in early 1977, I The next photography project I did, mm -hmm. um, I tried consciously to use the 8x10 and frame it in, a, in the way that 35 millimeter would, would frame. Hmm. So, um, 
by That's imagining right. what was beyond the or by uh, keeping by under, awareness of by, by understanding the difference in emphasis the frame gets that in one it implies a world that goes beyond the frame and yes. the other is closed a little closed universe mm -hmm. and to, to even though my viewing system didn't change i had in my mind to make the picture that had more of that 35 millimeter feel and i spent a month in uh it was in florida uh the picture of Ginger with the red shirt was during that time. There, uh, uh, there's a picture of her in bed and one of her in a swimming pool. Uh, another one of other people by a swimming pool, a picture of a mailbox. There's a picture of McDonald's on a table. And all of these I'm thinking about, and this is what was on my mind. Can I take a picture with the eight by 10 that felt like 35 millimeter and one of my favorite shots was the one of the McDonald's because it felt like when I took it I had come full circle from American circuses that this was now 1977 and five years before It was Taking a kind of picture with a Wally 35 for American circuses and now I've gone through this whole process five years of dissecting every formal variable I could think of and become conscious of them all. And with total deliberation, wind up making a picture with an eight by 10 that looks like one I would have done with a 35 millimeter. Yeah. Except that by going through that whole process, there's a different resonance to the decisions. Completely, and to that, and to the geometry of the composition. I think, as you describe that, um, that framing um, discipline or and way of thinking, it accounts for the um, uh, kind of openness of the pictures that where where you're as a viewer not thinking of it as a cropping. Um, but but as a seeing, you know, and and that there's this, which is you know, how how I interpret what you're saying and your thinking and what what distinguishes your pictures from random snapshots because they have that um, that precision that is also natural um, to seeing and vision. Um, and, and that really um, photography doesn't do that by itself. It's a photographer <laughs> who does it and, um, and, and, and does it um, in a deliberate way. You don't get that by um, uh, random chance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, another, um, I, I wanted to loop back a little bit to um, and I think it, it layers on to what you've been saying about um, composition and cameras um, to the idea of um, making pictures that are the way, like, kind of akin to the way people talk and that, uh, that um, uh, kind of way of um, getting at the vernacular. What so intrigued me about that and, and became kind of kicked off my writing was thinking about yeah the way people talk is not simple and it's um it, it's actually really complicated and it takes place in real time and it's dependent on you know local variations and popular slang and you know there's and a mutual understanding that it's that it's an exchange, um, unlike you know a written text that we can still read things from the 1700s and you know they're they kind of have a different um, um, way of speaking for themselves, right? Um, but but speaking the language of um, of speech and of conversation is different, and um, and I. I it was realizing how complex of an aim that was that I thought, okay, now this is starting to make sense for me in the context of Stephen's work. Um, wh where was that coming from for you? Well, as you were saying that, I had I thought about something I haven't thought about in a long time. 
which is um, when I was in high school, I didn't know how to type. Mm -hmm. And I would write my school essays by hand. And this obviously was a long time ago before there were computers and before there were word processors, if anyone remembers what a word processor is. Uh, and if I were to get to the bottom of a page and decide I was going in the wrong direction and wanted to change my mind, I would have to rewrite the entire page. And so I tended to think about what I was writing in advance so that I knew and, and worked out all these twists and turns so that by the time I actually sat down and wrote, it had all been worked out. But I also felt that in that process, some of the spontaneity of the thought started getting lost. And then computers happened and I realized I could just sit down and write. And I didn't have to worry about if I have a tangential thought, put it down. I can take it out later. It doesn't matter what I write. In a way, it doesn't have to, I'm not, let me put it this way. I don't have to think about what I'm writing being the final version. Mm -hmm. uh, if, I, if there's a thought I want to approach from two different directions, I can write down both directions yeah. and then come back to it later. And so it allows me to write as I'm thinking. If I, I'm not quite that good at typing, but it comes close to it yeah. rather than over distillation that I was going through when I was in school. Mm -hmm. And I think that's connected to it. it that, is. that this is for me one of the one of the liberating factors of computers in terms of writing is that I don't have to overthink things before I write them down. Uh -huh. And that I find myself doing it occasionally, but then once I start writing and get into it, then there's this kind of flow happens and the words just start coming out. Mm -hmm. And I don't have to put up this barrier of second guessing myself because I can, I can look at it later. Yeah. Well, in, in picture making though, in digital, that's the way a lot of photographers might talk about digital cameras. Yeah. And, and you've certainly yeah. used many of them, but it doesn't seem like you've quite kind of gone that other, sought um, out that sort of flow. Having said that about writing, I have a great deal of problem with that in digital cameras. Yeah. Because the work of photographers whose work I've followed for years and whose work felt very deliberate in film. And deliberate, I don't mean stuffy and dead. I mean the product of intentionality. Yeah. Then they, these same people pick up a digital camera and it's like all their intentionality vanishes mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't have to be that way a digital camera can be used with as much intentionality as um as an eight by ten on the other hand i would occasionally watch a photographer work and see that with film there was a hesitation like they just can't take the picture like they're almost gonna take it they just want to take it and it's like, take the goddamn picture already. Take it. Uh, they're censoring themselves before they take it. Yeah. Well, I guess the process you've just been describing, your own process of kind of um, having already organized and visualized a picture kind of... Um, uh, keeps you away from either one of those extremes. You know, you're not going to hesitate to make the exposure, nor are you going to kind of shoot wildly in hopes that you got it. You know, you either way. Exactly. And I think that's what I'm getting at. It's, yeah. That's exactly the point. That there is this third way that is spontaneous and intentional from the beginning. Yeah. And, and to say that I have an idea in my mind, I have a visualization, in my mind of the picture doesn't i don't want it to sound like it's deadening yeah. because as, I, as i'm working and seeing other things in the scene that mental model keeps changing so it, it's it's ongoing 
Yeah. But, but it is in the moment. Yes, it's in the moment. To say you have a mental image, I want to be more specific. I'm conscious of the mental image because we always have a mental image mm -hmm. because that's how we see. We have this illusion that we have these windows in the front of our face and we're these people back in here and we look out through these windows. Well, but the, <laughs> just like a digital camera, light comes in and is focused by a lens on a digital array. And the digital array in our eye is the retina. Mm -hmm. and it converts the image to an electrical signal. And it sends that electrical signal through a nerve to our brain and in the and just like taking a flash drive and sticking it into your computer the brain is taking that electrical signal and converting it into a mental image so we think we're seeing something in front of us but what we're seeing is a mental image that is created out of an electrical signal and what i'm talking about is being conscious of it being conscious of, of it as a mental image. And um, uh, maybe that takes, uh, that allows for the spontaneity to continue. Yeah, I think so. And it also accounts for something um, that, you know, I've noticed always in your work, and it's certainly the case in this book where, um, let's say a, a kind of category of subjects like um, pictures of pictures. Um, that's something that draws your attention, certainly. And um, but the, what the what the photographs sort of portray is the process of that mental modeling and how um, you know they're not. Um, it's not a repetitive exercise. You know, it's a it's a response to that seen in and of itself, but also in relation to the other times you've seen and pictured similar things. So it's kind of um, how you discover again and again ways that um, vision produces pictures, you know, um, both in the mind, in the brain, as you've just said, in the camera, and um, you know, and in the world. Uh, so it's kind of, you know, a, a really explicit consideration of framing, but also of um, this sort of, um, I guess, our hardwired picturing activity. That's what our brains are doing. I think those are maybe a type of picture that sometimes can be read only on the level of kind of vernacular culture or um, um, maybe again into the nostalgic category, um, but I see them as very much about perception, about, um, about, about the um, act of picturing. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of, it's incidental if the um, subject is a, you know, a, an amateur painting of a woman with a, <laughs> a funny looking hairstyle, you know, it's also about um, how that object sits on a wall or leans up against a table or is glimpsed through a window, um, that it's, it's sort of um, drive to make and notice pictures. I think it may have to do with another aspect of the, the awareness of the mental image, which is uh, what might be called today metacognitive attention. Mm -hmm. so that, that means being aware of myself seeing. So it's not just seeing, it's aware, it's a, there's a self-awareness of seeing. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I'm not just taking a picture, I'm aware of the picture as a picture as I'm taking it, which is I think what you're getting at now. I think that's why I've been interested in, in pictures of pictures. There's, yeah. there, there's this kind of self-referential reminder that I'm seeing. Now, one, uh, one thing that 
occurs to me is that one of the things I see in Instagram, and it, it's very tricky to generalize about Instagram because it's used in so many divergent ways, but there are pictures that say 30 years ago, people would not post, would not have taken. For example, um, pictures of people holding an object of theirs, a, an ice cream cone, and it's a picture of the hand. Uh, I've seen pictures behind steering wheels where you see the hand on the steering wheel, mm -hmm. uh, looking down on the ground and, and uh, what's on the floor and your feet are in the picture, uh, and pictures of food. There's a kind of self-awareness, and I think it may come from um, that what people are seeing when they're taking a picture is uh, this. They're looking at a monitor. They're looking at a display. And it's an unconscious reminder. And this is not regardless of their, if whether they're a photographer or not, just an average person. Holy, it's an unconscious reminder that, that I'm not looking at some of my bills and my stapler on my desk, I'm looking at an image of it. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think simply using the phone reinforces that kind of self-awareness. And I think that's why there uh, is um, so frequently seen those pictures that feel self-aware in a way that snapshots of 40 years ago wouldn't. Yeah. Well, and there's also that question of delivery too, because you're looking at a monitor and that's where that image is gonna live forever, probably. I mean, with very few exceptions, it's not going to have another manifestation on paper um, or on film, um, let's say. Um, whereas um, part of what you had to think about, whether with the um, small format or large format is, um, would there be a, a, an outcome as a print? And of course, the answers were different then than they are now. And that might be, you can tell me one of the, one of the if not the primary, a secondary appeal to going back and revisiting work such as this for the Transparencies book is when you made those transparencies, I mean, it's no accident that you use that as your title, um, there may, you might not have been very happy with or excited about the output options. Um, so, you know, now a lot of different choices, including the printed page. Yeah, that's exactly true. Um, one of the reasons that work never really got seen, there's a, Kodachrome, which is the film I used, is an extraordinarily beautiful film. Yeah. The tonality is just fabulous. It's so, it's so rich and subtle at the same time. Um, and transparencies are beautiful things. They just, mm -hmm. just as we're used to seeing pictures on displays, on rear lit displays now, and how radiant they are. This is how, what Kodachrome's were like. Making a print was always difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, you could make a copy negative and make a, a C print from it, but it, it was a generation removed and it looked terrible. Yeah. Uh, the best way at the time, this was before Cibachrome, the best way at the time was dye transfer. Mm -hmm. A dye transfer was one very expensive, but also I just didn't like the way the dyes sat on the paper. It felt like they were heavy and sat on the surface, where a C print, the image feels like it's embedded in the paper. Yeah. Um, and so there was no really good way of printing them until, as you said, books came along and digital printing. And so now, particularly digital printing, and, and now I can make beautiful prints from these. Yeah. So yeah. that's without, one of the reasons that the, the work was sort of untouched, just like yeah. uh, in uh, my retrospective, we showed a series of uh, uh, stereo pictures I took. But I, at, when I, after I, I took them, I realized there's nothing I can really do with them. Yeah. Uh, I, I showed them once at Light Gallery and, and 
from a, a, a person I met borrowed a, a viewer that Stereo Realist made as a display for camera stores, which yeah. held a dozen slides and it had black Bakelite knobs and a yes. light inside. But it was never available commercially and I've never been able to find one I could buy. So I, I just couldn't show the work until the uh, exhibition designer at MoMA found these beautiful stainless steel uh, 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 stereo transparency viewing boxes in Amsterdam. And I couldn't figure out why they were being made because how many people are using stereo real cameras? Well, we use the same ones. I did a 3D exhibition at LACMA in 2017, and we use the same manufacturers. So, you know, there's not a great demand, but there's a sincere one. But it's. I have a theory about why they're being made. <laughs> What's that? In Amsterdam. There's a market for 3D pornography in Amsterdam. <laughs> okay, well, they've always been hand in hand, I will say, 3D uh, representation and pornography. But I was, of course, I was interested to discover that you'd done Stereo Realist, you know, in the sort of in this period, more or less. Um, but then I thought, well, in a way that is a very similar um, uh, perceptual discipline um, that it requires. And knowing as you did um, how one's sight works and how that um, converts into a two dimension, you know, an image on a two dimensional sheet of paper um, predisposes you to have, you know, an ability to compose with the realist camera, which cannot be used like a normal camera. Um, you have to think about what it is doing. You have to think about the way sight um, synthesizes a left and a right eye view. And um, you obviously already had that dialed in. One thing's a bit of a change of tack, but um, one thing I wanted to ask you about, and you've talked about it many times before, the fact that um, um, these campaigns, not just the um, for this book, but for American Surfaces and other projects, have been based on road trips, and we're not, and some of them solitary, not all of them, and we're now in this moment where um, we suddenly have a totally different view of traveling and um and of staying in place moving around you're about to take off on your for your summer in montana on a road trip are you thinking about that differently than you were in the 70s well i'm doing it as quickly as i can yeah and i'm not stopping along the way uh so it, it's it's not uh a photographic adventure it's it's getting from one place to another. Yeah. Yeah, so, so it's, it's not the wandering and uh, photographic seeing that you were doing then. <laughs> another thing, it's a bit related, but some of the, sometimes um, the, some of the pictures that are well known from Uncommon Places, for example, might appear to the viewer um, to um, as if, and it may or may not be true, as if you're kind of on your own in a, an otherwise more or less deserted um, area, whether it's, you know, because you're not seeing a lot of people in the streets. They seem to be pretty quiet towns or roadsides. However, with the handheld camera, obviously, you can be more in the mix with um, street life. And indeed, in this um, new book, you there are sidewalk scenes where you're, you know, kind of um, capturing your fe fellow pedestrians and children being pulled by the hand and you're kind of shoulder to shoulder with people. Um, that, uh, how did you, um, I guess, I guess the question I'm thinking of is how did you keep your focus on your way of seeing when you were really kind of also having to be aware of, you know, other people around you and them seeing you with a camera and potentially, you know, double taking and so on. How did you keep your mind um, occupied with the picture that you were trying to get? Um, the honest answer is that I don't remember. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you still uh, make pictures, you know, you're still, you still walk in the street with a camera and make pictures when there are other people around. Yeah. 
and, and, and that the other pictures, the eight by 10 pictures, didn't have a lot of people. There were two things going on. One was um, that in a lot of these towns, there really aren't a lot of people on the street. Yeah, that's the impression I get. You know, once you get, well, I mean, think about the difference between New York and LA. Mm -hmm. You see a lot of people. Once you get out of downtown LA, do you really see a lot of people walking on the street? Only, only now. <laughs> That's temporary. Right. I think. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. And the other thing is, I'm often with the eight by ten doing having exposures of say a fifteenth of a second, where if someone's moving, they'd be blurred. So, yeah. I, but if if it were important to me to have lots of people on the street. I wouldn't go to these small towns and I wouldn't be using an 8x10 for yeah. limiting factors. Um, but in the uh, 90s, I started working with black and white 8x10 mm -hmm. and went to uh, a village in Italy called Luzzara. And using black and white gave me two more stops of exposure. And those two stops allowed me to photograph people up close with the eight by 10 without making it a formal portrait, without saying you have to hold still, mm -hmm. uh, which I would, would do if I were using color. Uh, and if you're working on, at the margin of what your technology can handle, then any change in the technology changes the aesthetic possibilities. Yeah, opens up entirely new kinds of pictures, yeah. So stops of exposure makes a huge difference in what I can photograph. Yeah. And going from an eight by 10 to a Leica opens tremendous possibilities. And so there are yeah. shots that, like that picture of uh, in downtown Las Vegas. Uh -huh. There's no way I could possibly take that with an 8x10. Yeah. But there's something else, which is that the cameras have different feelings. I talked about different viewing systems. Yeah. But there's a different feeling. And there's, for example, a shot of a rusty mailbox in near the beginning of, yeah. of uh, Nazis. And I just know that if that were taken with an 8x10, it would, it would feel different. It would feel like somehow a study of it. Mm -hmm not seeing it mm -hmm. this is more like first person noticing it yeah yeah uh, noticing. yeah hard to say what the difference is that the the aspect ratio is a little different that may have something to do with it but there's just something in the feel mm -hmm. that i don't know have you have any insight into it you look at <laughs> thousands of pictures all the time well, I was also, in my mind, I was drawing a connection with another thing you've said about different cameras or, and that you recalled about this period of um, uh, the being a kind of, that you with the um, small format could seem more like a regular guy with a camera and not, you know, a capital P photographer with a big, you know, tripod or something like that. And then I was thinking also about how that, um, that range of options um, still carries forward because you have done a lot of work just using your iPhone, um, but also using you know much more sizable and elaborate digital cameras. You know they they have different feels. They have different. Um, they produce different pictures, and they also allow you to operate differently out in the world. Right? I mean, it's a different. Um, um, because to the extent that you know, physically making a photograph is you know, something you do out in the world and in public and may or may not be people around you. But if there are, the um, scale of the camera and the, um, the way you have to move around with it is going to be observed and potentially, you know, spark interactions that um, you might or might not want to have in that mm -hmm. moment. Although, ironically, there have been times when I use the 8x10 that I'm the most invisible. Really? How does that happen? Well, uh, I, I did a series in New York. Uh, they're like big black and white panoramas. I don't know if you've ever seen them. Uh, in, well, in the retrospective catalog. Yes. I think, yeah. And they're, they're 
I'm, I'm using eight by 10 film that I'm pushing to a high ISO. Uh, the prints are uh, maybe three by eight feet. Uh, and I'm photographing people sometimes six feet away from me. I'm setting up at a street corner and waiting and photographing people as they're waiting to cross the street. And no one pays any attention. This could just be, it's New York and people think they're too sophisticated. I mean, it's not like they don't see me, they walk around me, yeah. they speak to me. But if I were to pick up a, a DSLR or, or a Nikon or something that looks like a camera and aim it at them, that day, I know from experience people will say, hey buddy, why are you taking my picture? Or, even in New York, maybe even less polite than that. Yeah. Uh, and, but when I used the eight by 10, no one said a word. Once a woman with a young child, I don't know, maybe a 10 year old child came by, or maybe not eight or nine, and she said, that's what an old camera used to look like. So people were seeing it. Yeah. I really could photograph someone five feet away, and I'm standing there. With holding a cable release, looking at them, waiting for, watching their expressions, waiting for the right moment, and no one says anything. Great, because then the camera, by, um, the camera then kind of protects you and lets you get that picture that you wanted without kind of changing the, um, the affect of, you know, the people who happen to pass nearby it, because that's not what you wanted it to do. <laughs> that surprises me though. Thank you, Stephen. It was great to talk with you and hear more about how you think and work. And thanks everyone for watching this and please look for the new book, Stephen Shore, Transparencies, Small Camera Works 1971 to 1979 from Mac. Thanks so much. Bye.